Uh, we are launching today with an old African proverb. It states, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Now, like all good proverbs, this one is old enough that folks struggle to remember who said it first. But one very famous person to whom it is credited is Kwame Nkrumah, a pivotal leader in Ghana's journey toward independence in 1957. This man eventually became Ghana's first prime minister and president, embodying a vision that helped to unify and move Ghana toward their true calling. Now, a previous student of mine, Agnes Nagini Lungat, she now teaches at the Kenyan Highlands Evangelical University, she speaks of this man with awe, and I can see why. And Kruma challenged his native Ghanaians that if they were ever to be free, that all Africa must be free. He told his people that if we as Africans, not as tribal or national groups, but as Africans, are going to secure our independence and plot out our course on this planet, we're going to have to confront that task together. He became a powerful voice for the vision of an economically and politically united Africa. And he said, we do not look east, we do not look west, we look forward. And he assured his people that the forces that united them were far more powerful and intrinsic than the, quote, superimposed influences that keep us apart. This was Nkrumah's hard-won insight regarding the nature of real success for the people he loved. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Now, the wisdom literature of Israel is, de is designed to collect sayings such as these, uh, memorizable capsules of hard-earned insight birthed from experiences of the old and battle-scarred, the ones who've actually faced down life's dragons and lived to tell the tale for the sake of we who are perhaps not so old and not so battle-scarred. And so the preacher of the book of Ecclesiastes, who is both old and <coughs> battle-scarred, offers us his hard-won hard insight regarding the nature of real success for the people that he loved. And this is what he has to say. Two are better than one, because they have a better return for their labor. And if either of them falls, one will help the other up. But woe to the one who falls when there's no companion to lift him. Moreover, if two lie down together, they keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? And although one can overpower him who is alone, two will be able to stand against the one. Indeed, a cord of three strands will not quickly be torn apart. Now, when I teach wisdom literature, I like to compare it to the self-help literature that abounds in our modern lives. Uh, I particularly like a comparison with Stephen Covey's famous Seven Habits for Highly Effective People, Powerful Lessons in Personal Change. Mm -hmm. hmm. Now remember that I teach undergraduates, so the deal is you hook the fish fast or you never get him in the boat. Hence the illustration. All right, so Covey's ambition is a holistic, integrated, principle-centered approach for solving personal and professional problems. So too is wisdom literature. And like Covey, wisdom literature makes use of penetrating insights and pointed anecdotes to reveal a step-by-step -step pathway for living with fairness, integrity, service, and human dignity. Principles that give us the security to adapt to change and the wisdom and power to take advantage of the opportunities that change creates. Now, please do keep in mind that Covey is a Mormon and his book would not have made the canonical cut. But all the same, wisdom literature tends to be an international genre and I hope the parallel is instructive. So I also offer my students at In Wisdom Literature a subtitle that you can see on my slide. How not to be stupid for the rest of your life. Do you see it? Uh, assimilate that. How not to be stupid for the rest of your life. That's really what wisdom literature is all about. So indeed, if your goal is not to be stupid for the rest of your life, wisdom literature is a worthwhile read. So how does it work? Well, wisdom lit, which is Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, 
Each of them explore how a person might exercise the discipline of applying truth of someone else's lived experience to one's own. The focus here is productive behavior. In the words of Albert Einstein, any fool can know the point is to understand. So what is what wisdom literature is trying to help us understand is what the good life actually is. Isn't that a question we all want answered? What the good life actually is. So when I teach the book of Ecclesiastes, which as you know is formally a dialogue of the meaning of life, I tell my classes that the preacher who is presented to us as Solomon himself is a mix of Britney Spears, O.J. Simpson, Justin Bieber, Elvis Presley, and Miley Cyrus. Now these, these are all Americans, but we're okay, right? You, you've heard of them, okay. Um, how could Koheleth actually be these people? And the answer is that the preacher of the Ecclesiastes is the guy who actually did have it all. Just like Brittany, Justin, Miley, O.J., and Elvis, and he found that having it all nearly destroyed him, just like Brittany, Justin, Miley, and Elvis. The difference is that unlike our contemporary luminaries, Koheleth, King Solomon, climbs the golden ladder of ultimate success, looks over the wall into what we would all classify as the paradise of power and affluence, fame and fortune, and he has the wherewithal to step back down from the edge, climb back down that golden ladder, and tell the rest of us poor, mediocre souls that there's nothing up there. There's nothing up there. That it's all a mirage. This guy who had it all, all the money, sex, and power any of us could ever dream of, and he tells us average Janes and Joes that it is all a mirage. Specifically, vanity of vanities, says Kohalath. All of it is vanity. And because of where he's been and what he's accomplished, his audience actually pauses in their hell-bent, breakneck pursuit of success. And at least for a moment, they listen. And this morning, I would like to challenge us to do the same. Let's take a moment. Let's pause in our hell-bent, breakneck pursuit of success. And let's listen. What does he have to say? Two are better than one. Because they have a better return for their labor. If either of them falls, one will help the other up. But woe to the one who falls when there is no companion, no friend, no colleague to help him up. Now, in this chapter, the preacher has just finished reflecting on the absurdity of working yourself to death for wealth. Now, we in the academic community will never be tempted to that particular foolishness <laughs> because we will never be particularly wealthy. We have other temptations. That's the first half of chapter four. And here he concludes that the pursuit of well success, excellent grades, admittance to the program of your dreams, the perfect post, teaching of vows, tenure publications, speaking engagements, notoriety, influence, and political positions by oneself does not fulfill. To put it bluntly, he concludes that work in isolation stinks. That beating out the pack to grab the brass ring alone leaves the winner the loser. And real success, influence, and notoriety actually comes from sharing the journey. Hmm. As I read these lines, I hear echoes of the rigorous realities of the typical Israelite farmer living in Iron Age Israel. That's because that's of what I do. Now this surely would have been the bulk of the preacher's audience, yes? The man and woman living in a village of two to three hundred, scrambling to get the food they need from their small patch of rain-supported earth, following their flocks to the hill country, hoping to survive the next pregnancy, hoping there will be a next pregnancy, and barely keeping body and soul together. In this context, the catastrophic consequences of a shepherd tumbling off an escarpment and finding himself with a shattered bone at the bottom of a wadi were broadly known. 
and they were feared. Long cold nights out in the high country alone could be miserable long journeys from one urban center to the next for the sake of business or pleasure on the unguarded highways of the Levant could indeed be a mortal journey. And the biblical stories of the Good Samaritan, the desperate host of Judges 19, and the high value set on hospitality throughout the Middle East speak to this reality and illustrate it for us. A few armed ruffians could easily overpower a traveler alone, steal his animals and his assets, but a traveler with his companion, ah, two could resist one. So as many have noted, this passage in Ecclesiastes celebrates the practical advantages of companionship. That comes from our colleague Craig Bartholomew in his 2009 commentary on the book of Ecclesiastes, but I would like to add a little more skin to the game. Not just the practical advantages of companionship, I think the preacher's intent, like so much of wisdom literature, is both pedagogical and corrective. You see, I think the preacher is confronting a lie. A lie that had become a societal norm. A lie his audience had been braced as truth. Go fast, go alone. But the preacher says that's not truth. He says that he has learned the hard way that that truth actually destroys. Now to be very clear, I'm not preaching this sermon at you today. No, I'm largely preaching this sermon at me today. You see, I have been described more than once as the girl who walks like she's on her way to a fire. I have been described as someone who walks fast, talks fast, and as my husband will tell you, takes on way more than I should. I demand a lot of the people around me. I demand a lot more of myself. I work too much and I sleep too little. I've been trained to go fast. This is the value system of our disciplines, isn't it? Real scholars sprint to the head of the pack, we grab that brass ring, and we leave the less fleet of foot behind. Right? Yeah. Our job is to quickly identify the weakest link and more quickly disassociate ourselves from the same. To work hard, keep my shoulder to the wheel, never ask for help, and never reveal my weaknesses. I've been trained to strike before my opponent can draw his wand and leave him in the dust. I've been trained to go alone. And the fact that I'm now in my 50s, I'm saying that out loud in public, <laughs> and have spent all of those 50 years as a woman in a very male world, well, going alone has not always been an active choice. <laughs> but always, in the midst of that ethos, my heart would always somehow, somewhere, hear the voice of the preacher. Two are better than one. Now, it hasn't been terribly difficult for me to push the preacher's wisdom to the periphery. You know that periphery, where warm, nostalgic thoughts that I don't actually attend to live. You know that periphery. Uh, the things I think about, but I don't actually practice, live over here. And I'm going to guess that the preacher's original audience did much the same. So the preacher pushes his point. Can you hear him? Two are better than one because they have a better return for their labor. How can that be? Well, you want to make as much as you can, right? That's what the preacher asks. Well, do you realize that if two men work a field, the work is done more than twice as quickly, and the extent of the plowing and planting is broader than what one man could have given in the same amount of time? Do you realize that when two prepare the study guide, that both wind up with more than twice as much time to study for the big exam? Do you know that? Two have a better return for their labor. Moreover, if either of them falls while following the flock, one will help the other up. Are you listening? A person who works alone doesn't get to make mistakes. She doesn't have the capacity to bounce back. No one has got her back when she's blindsided. And if the bone is broken, woe to the one who falls when there's no companion to lift her up. Mm -hmm. Furthermore,
more unlike what I've been taught, two traveling the same road is not a waste of resources. I think perhaps I should be British. Because if two lie down, they both keep warm. And how can one keep warm alone? And if the worst happens, and let me tell you, it usually does, although one can overpower him who is alone, two will be able to hold their ground. Indeed, says the preacher, quoting an even older proverb, a cord made of three strands cannot quickly be torn apart. I'm trying. Mm. Mm. Thank you. All right. Did I do that or did you do that? <laughs> Who knows? It was the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, a cord of three strands cannot quickly be torn apart. Hmm. As Schaefer first argued in 1967, this, probably, this proverb probably makes its first appearance in the epic tale of Gilgamesh, the Sumerian version of the epic tale of Gilgamesh. Perhaps you'd like this more uh, Avengers-style image of Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Here, Gilgamesh encourages friend Enkidu that together they can turn the tide. Two men will not die. The towed boat will not sink. A tow rope of three strands cannot be cut. If you help me and I help you, what of ours can anyone carry off? Lines 106 to 10. Now, my dear friend and resident Assyriologist, everyone should have a resident Assyriologist, I think. Adam Miglio is his name. He counters that the lines here are not all that clear, and Schaefer may have overplayed his hand. But what we see here is the predictable mobility of a really good proverb. If you want to go far, go together, because a cord of three strands cannot, whoops, I should go the other direction, cannot be torn apart. A tow rope of three strands cannot be cut. And the practical application of truth to our lives as far back as Gilgamesh is that two, even three, are better than one. So what is wisdom? In my older age, I have at last begun to hear the preacher. Contrary to the traumas of my youth, contrary to my socialization as an Ivy League graduate, contrary to the values of my society and my training, the preacher is right. Two are better than one. So, future <laughs> academics and pastors and current academic and pastors, what is really driving you? Is it to catch the eye and ear of your senior professor or that senior journal? Is it to prove to him or her that you really are the best of the best at any cost? Then may I suggest that what it is you want is to go fast. What might it look like if what you really wanted was to go far? Are you aware that the people sitting around you in this room right now are the future senior scholars, principals, deans, and bishops of our world? Do you realize that going with them is far more advantageous than going alone? What does this look like? Well, one thing it looks like is showing up for your compatriots. I know for myself, I get so stinking task-oriented that I can spend the entire day at my desk staring at my books, punching away at my computer. Getting myself to chapel to hear a colleague speak, making time to invite a coworker to coffee or a meal can feel like attempting a tooth extraction in my world. But as ethicist Christine Pohl teaches us, hospitality, transparency, truth-telling, accountability, and teammanship are the stuff of which a community is made. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. And folks, we have a cord in the kingdom of Christ that must not be torn apart. We will go far if we go together. It also means, in the words of good old Stephen Covey, who I will say one more time is a Mormon and would not have made the cut in our canon, interdependence via a win-win thinking and mutual understanding and sacrifice and synergy that would be combining people's gifts as opposed to competing over them is the road to success. Paul says it this way. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond cord of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. 
one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. That's Ephesians 4. We, though many, are one body in Christ and individually parts of another. That's Romans 12. And if you don't know that, Conrad might be cutting those 10 points <laughs> off. Two are better than one because they have a better return for their labor. And if either of them falls, one will help the other up. But woe to the one who falls when there's no companion to lift him. If two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And although one can overpower a man alone, two will be able to stand. Indeed, a cord of three strands will not quickly be torn apart. These proverbs are designed to be memorized. They're designed to be memorized so that you can recite them in times of stress and challenge. They're designed to live right up front, not in the periphery. Guys, when I face a task with you, I have hope that between the two of us, we can do something bigger than either of us could ever do alone. When I travel with you, there's a joy and a confidence in the journey that I would never have alone. So I have decided that I would rather go far than fast because I believe that I am far more assured of my destination if I go with you than if I go alone. And I'm assured that when I get to my destination, I not only want the people I've labored with to be with me, I would still like them to be speaking to me <laughs> when we arrive. So Kwame Nkrumah assured his people that the focuses, the forces that united them were far more powerful and intrinsic than the superimposed influences that keep us apart. I believe that Koheleth and Paul, and indeed our elder brother Jesus, the Christ, who shed the spirit abroad in our hearts would concur. What would it look like if we learned to go together? What would it look like if we shared both the work and the journey? What would it look like if we celebrated each other's gifts, slowed down a bit for those on the journey who travel at a lesser space? Pace? and stood at the ready always to defend our traveling companions. What would it look like? If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Amen. Amen. <laughs>